let's continue singing. There is a name I love to hear. Let us pray. 
Father God, we come before you. Thank you so much for your goodness and your faithfulness in our lives. Lord God, you, you saw us through, Lord, through COVID, through wintry weather, storm, Lord, uh, that is epic. We've not experienced this before. And to those that had difficulty through it, Lord, I just want to say thank you so much for bringing us back. Knowing, Lord God, that our, uh, our, our measure of joy is not on material things, but it's the life that you give us each and every day. So we want to say thank you so much, God. Thank you for bringing us back as well. As many of us have been uh, uh, quarantined just for uh, precautionary measures, Lord, uh, due, to, due, due to this pandemic, thank you for bringing us back, Lord, safely into your house. Lord, help us to worship. Help us to put away all these distractions aside focus on you and what you are doing in our lives and what you are doing to speak to us so that we can be faithful to be in followers for you and expanding the kingdom uh, for, for you. We love you, Father, and give you thanks. Amen. All right. I'll turn it to Brother Carl. Good morning. So glad to be here this morning with everybody gathered. And for those of you who are joining us online on our Facebook platform, we're so happy that everybody is here. It's a time in our service every week when we talk about generosity. And it's about the time that we, you know, and I know you probably think this is only about uh, how much money do you want from me this week. But, you know, God wants so much more for us. He, he said in Malachi 3.10, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now if you're willing, said the word of If I will not open to you the windows of heaven, Pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So it's not that God wants from you. He wants to give to you. He wants it for you. So we all know that in our economy, we don't bring bushels of peas or corn or sheep or we wouldn't bring bushels of sheep. You wouldn't, you wouldn't bring livestock. You wouldn't bring produce. We have a cash-based society, right? And so we think of giving. We think of, you know, money. Uh, but there's so much more about giving that God wants us to understand. And, and giving from our cash resources is certainly something that we want to do. And, and we can do that either with a check or through the generosity app on your iPhone or your Android phone. Uh, make it very convenient for you. But together, uh, as, as givers, we're able to do a whole lot more than we can individually. But, but there's more. God wants you to give. And what if, what if, you, gave, what if you gave the leadership? What if you were able to give a mentoring relationship to somebody who needed to grow in Christ? What if, what, if, what if you were able to mentor a student? What if you were able to give by employing the gifts of grace that each of us receives as a believer when we're born again? So some of us may be able to teach or somebody, somebody somewhere has wisdom. I, 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 don't, I don't get to meet those people. But some have faith. Some have gifts of healing. Some can speak foreign languages. And I know we're going on a mission trip down to the valley. And some of you may be gifted to be able to speak you know, Spanish as a second language. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. And some of you can do other things. Maybe you have, maybe you have not just gifts, not the charisma that God gives us as we're born again. But maybe you have some talents as well. You know, Some of us have hidden talents. Some of us have abilities. But those are things that you can do that will bless the body of Christ. Does anybody have any clue what that word is for, for the talent that you need? It's the word that we use for deacon. It means it's something that you can do to serve the body of Christ. And in specifically, this body of Christ, serving to other believers. And then both of those things, the gifts that you get from the Holy Spirit and the abilities that you have from your DNA, you know, the way God wired you, those both can be used in combination with the energy. And that word in the Greek is energeo. So, power that you get from God directly. His Holy Spirit living in us. So what we're doing isn't just collecting our measly, paltry stuff. What we're doing is we're joining together as a body of believers to pool resources, not just financial, but spiritual gifts, abilities, all of those things, and for what point that God's kingdom would be blessed. So that's why we have this time of giving and worship every week. So can I ask a couple of you guys to come forward to receive our morning offering? Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your loving kindness. We thank you that you, that you love us.
close enough to sing the one begotten the Son, and we can have eternal life. And, and not only with that blessing of being adopted into your family, we also get the extra blessing of having the Holy Spirit live in us. And not only do we get that, but we also get with that a, a gift that we can use to benefit the kingdom. And God, help us to benefit this kingdom in all that we do. Help us to hold our resources loosely so that you can use them. Help us to have our charismatic gifts, those gifts of grace that you've given us, whether it's a teaching gift or a mentoring gift or a helps gift, whatever it might be, God, that we would employ that for your kingdom. And God, then you've given us all abilities. Some, some can repair things and some have, have other kinds of gifts, but all of them can be used to bring honor and glory to you and to bless this body of believers. So God, I pray that you'll help us to always consider that, Father, what you want from us isn't just something, but you want everything. All that we are, all that you created us to be, to be a blessing to you. And I pray that we will be that on this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Is he your living hope this morning? You might appreciate you letting me know. It's just a simple word. It's a simple word. God, you us. How we thank you. That not only you give us eternal life, you give us hope as well. We all have faced you know, challenges this year as a, as a community, as a nation. We face challenges. We try to be continue to be faithful. And in you, we can have a thank you for so much. You were worth the beginning. One with you.
we want to be able to voice and and to declare our confidence in our relationship with you this morning. What a blessing it is to know you and to know that in spite of the fact that we were dead in sin, you sent your only begotten Son that we might have eternal life. And thank you, God, for that blessed gift. I pray, Father, over Jackson as he comes to speak this morning. God, may your name be glorified. Holy Spirit, would you open up your Scripture to us and help us to hear your Word as it applies to each of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for joining us. Those that are tuning in at home, uh, welcome. Um, in our series, uh, Great Expectations, a series of men on mission. So if you recall the Apollo program in the 1960s, in 1961, President John F. Kennedy challenged, he set the goal for the nation to land astronauts into the moon by the end of the decade. NASA met that challenge with the Apollo program. It was the first time human beings were left, um, had left the Earth or, uh, Earth's orbit and visited another planet. These missions made it impo- possible for, to explore more distant worlds further in the future. It was the goal set to expand the horizon of human engineering, technology, human passion, and perseverance determination that the U.S. was going to be the first nation to be able to land into the moon. Similarly, Jesus Christ sets the same challenge, the same challenge and goal for us as Christians. It is the goal to evangelize the world for Jesus' name, right? Into the Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, into the ends of the earth. Yes, there's a cost. There always is a cost. It's an occupational hazard, but we do it in obedience and in glorifying our God the Father. Any church not involved in Great Commission has forfeited its biblical rights to exist, according to O.S. Smith. Charles Swindoll writes this, Wherever we, Whatever we do, we must not treat the Great Commission like it's the Great Suggestion. And Charles Spurgeon, the famous uh, preacher of our time, says every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. So we have to make the distinction, right? As Christians, what are we do? What do we do here on earth? Are we just taking up space or do we have a goal set before us by our Father? And are we obedient into following that goal? Are we obedient and following and completing the objective for us? Because as you guys know, we've been hit with a few things as Christians, right? Just last year, I remember us driving back from our trip, our spring break mission trip to Brownsville onto 59 North, and there's this clamor. Should we, should, there's all this madness. What are we going to do? What, what are we going to do without toilet paper? Right? Toilet paper. Think about that. And then slowly, as we edge into Waller, into our community, they started, and that these schools were announcing, oh, guess what? Waller ISD just closed. This uh, school district has closed. And remember that, for some of you guys that were in the van, we're there clamoring and clapping and all that stuff. Wow, I'm going to have an extended spring break, just one extra week. Lo and behold, we found out that it's for the rest of the semester. <laughs> Who could ever thought? That Zoom calls, right? Microsoft Teams comes into being, comes into light, and people are having to work from home. Imagine that. Imagine all the the, the masks, the masks that we wear. This was not in existence. I'm sure it was in other countries, but this has become a cultural norm now, right? Believe it. We We have these. They sell these now. Amazing, right? Our plans and our thoughts have changed. We are faced with challenges. And two weeks ago, we had this winter storm that came into Texas. It was much colder here than in Alaska. I mean, you can't, you can't make this up. And we've experienced it. You experienced this yourself with the rolling blackouts, right? 
And some of you guys didn't have water for days. Some of you guys didn't have electricity. And you couldn't, you couldn't send texts. If I sent it, it would just, there's this bar that would just kind of linger in the middle of the screen. Not sure if it's going to go anywhere or not. And now we're back again. Amazingly, with the challenges that we face in life, the goal is still there. Help us as, as Christians, Lord, help us to focus on that objective in our life. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Missionary work to evangelize the lost is mission critical. For every Christian, it's your job. It's my job. It's everyone's job to do this task. Whether you are young, whether you are old, whether you're rich or you're poor, whether you're educated or edumacated is what I hear when I was younger. If you live in the city or in the country, right, it's mission critical. We are all supposed to do this. And we will see in Paul and Barnabas' travels what they entailed, what situations they were placed into, what challenges. But the peace that God brings through those challenges is irreplaceable. So, we, if you want to look at the map, we've had this map for a while. Um, we'll give it just a few seconds there. So if you notice, Paul and Barnabas started their missionary journey into the city of Antioch. If you guys see it right there, okay, Antioch, that little uh, orange uh, circle, right? And then they traveled by ship, right? They, they took like a carnival a cruise line uh, through the Mediterranean into a, uh, the uh, country of Cyprus, Okay, and then that's where they, if you recall, that is actually um, uh, Barnabas' hometown. He, he, that's where he's from, from the, from the islands. And then they uh, went from Salamis to uh, Paphos, and then into Perga, right? And then to Antioch, another city called Antioch. And then last week, we were in that city, Iconium, and now we're going to go into the city called Lystra, which is just south of Iconium. So if you look at this, little background on this is that the background of Lystra, which we're going to talk about today, is just south of Iconium. It's part of the Roman colony. There were roads, like freeways, called the Via Sebaste uh, in the Roman Empire. And it's called the Com uh, Common Day Turkey. So if you look at these, this, 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 this right here, you know who were the first Asians ever exist? It was in China. It was right here. It's in Turkey. They were an Asian part of Asian Minor. So, yeah, these are my folks too, I guess. I'm just kidding. So, this, the, the, these were the first Asians, just FYI. So, sorry, that's not in my notes. So, part, Paul and Barnabas had big hearts for the people in this particular city, as was with Iconium and other cities that they, were, uh, that they encountered. But these two cities in particular, but with big hearts, it also gave them tremendous heartache, right? So, th so that their character was yielded and forged by God at this place. And we see this in 2 Timothy in, before, uh, before Paul was to be executed. He actually recounts two of these cities that gave him the heartache. If you notice in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 or 11, it says, Now you followed my teaching, my conduct, my purpose, my faith. Patience, love, perseverance, persecution, and sufferings, such as happened to me in Antioch, one city, at Iconium, the other city, and Lystra, which we are going to talk about today. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. So in other words, this city and another, Lystra, that Paul developed his full mastery and his reliance, his dependence on the Holy Spirit, so, so that his teaching, his manner of life, his conduct, his purpose, his, his faith, his patience, long-suffering, his charity, his perseverance and persecution and sufferings were fully developed. See, sometimes God has to take us in these cities, these journeys that we do not anticipate. These situations in life, knowing, yes, it is painful, but surely God is doing something to develop you and refine you and me to be better disciples for him so that, 
so that we don't lord it on ourselves, so that we can share God's goodness with those around us. That is our job, and that is our purpose. So before you tweet, before you post something, oh yeah, this is miserable, no, acknowledge what is God doing in that situation. What is God doing in your situation? Yes, your, your pipes of your water broke. Okay, right? We'll get it fixed. But what is God teaching you during that time? When, you're, when you are without electricity, what is God doing in you? What is God speaking in your life during that time? You see, all of things, all encompasses in God's work. Nothing is of surprise for him. Right? He uses that to refine us. Maybe perhaps we didn't have electricity so that we can spend deeper time with our devotion in God's words. Right? Perhaps. Perhaps he didn't, we didn't have access to our social media account because before we blast all these things and what we're experiencing, we would reflect on what God is doing in our lives. Perhaps. Right? Question mark. So all to say, God is doing something here. Today we'll see Paul and Barnabas go into another city, Lystria. This city also gave Paul and Barnabas heartache, but they also saw and witnessed growth in themselves. But something happened here that's a bit different regarding the response of the people at the city. Let's see what that is and how Christology, Jesus Christ, plays into their ministry. So uh, we're going to go ahead and stand up. We're going to read Acts chapter 14, verse 8 to 18. I know it's quite a lot of passage, but this is God's words, right? It's not my words. Please don't stand up for me. Stand up for God's words. It says here in verse 8, In Lystra, a man was sitting whose feet was incapacitated. He had been disabled from his mother's womb and never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, and Paul looked at him intently and saw that he had faith to be made well. And he said with a loud voice, Stand straight up on your feet. And the man leaped up and began to walk. And the crowd saw what Paul has done, and they raised their voice, saying in Lyconian language, The gods, small g, have become men like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus, Paul, Hermias, since he was the chief speaker. Moreover, the, ch- the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought an oxen, garlands to the gate, and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. But when the apostle Barnabas and Paul heard about this, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, saying, out, saying Men, why are you doing these things? We're also men, the same nature as you, preaching the gospel to you, to turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them. In past generations, he permitted all nations to go their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness. In that, he did, not, he did good and gave you rains from heaven, fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness, And even by saying these things, only with difficulty did they restrain the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. You may be seated. So my first point is, expect the unexpected when sharing the gospel. Expect the unexpected when sharing the gospel. It says in verse 11, the gods had become like men and had come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus Paul Hermias, since he was the chief speaker. You see, what was happening in that culture is that there's a lot of influence. There's a lot of paganism mixed with Greek mythology, all happening all at once. And the Jews were stuck in the middle, right? They were the immigrants of that region. Because after all, there were a bunch of Asians there. (laughs) I'm just kidding, right? The region in Asian minor, common day Turkey, was influenced by Greek goddesses, and mythology, it was the religion at that time period mixed with paganism, all mixed in together. So you see what we have to understand, if you recall maybe your, 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 your uh, days in high school or middle school reading this Greek mythology, right? I didn't read 
really was not interested in this uh, uh, as a young child. But it says here, right, Zeus, who is Zeus? Zeus is the sky and the thunder god, right? So if you think of like Marvel, you know, you think of Thor and stuff like that. This is kind of like that, that figment, this goddess, right? God, sorry, in ancient Greek religion who rules as king of the gods of, the, of Mount Olympus. Now Hermes is another Olympian deity in the ancient Greek religion and mythology. Hermes is considered the herald of gods, meaning he's also considered the protector of human heralds and uh, travelers and thieves and, and merchants and orators. So if you think about this, in, uh, if you put it in the context of Roman Catholicism, right? You have, you know, St. Francis of Assisi. You have all these different, right? St. Francis is known as uh, the, uh, the, 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 the father of, of, of human nature, mainly, I'm sorry, uh, nature in general, mainly animals, right? So you think of this in that context. Hermes was the god as a herald for these travelers and, and merchants, right? In, the, in myth, Hermes functioned as an emissary, as a messenger of the gods. So there's many, many gods that exist in Greek culture, in Greek mythology. But there are gods that do different things. And that was the context of what was happening in the city of Lystria. So what do we do when the audience become even more confused? Because really, that's what happened. They were hoping that they would become believers, but they end up worshiping the apostles themselves. And the response was like, no, no, we're just men like you and me. We're, no, or, we're just ordinary men, right? Like you. So what did they do? What was their response? See, the key is they brought it back to God the Father, the Creator God. In other words, they minimized themselves as men and maximize God. Does that make sense? So in preaching, in teaching, in evangelizing, you got to minimize yourselves because you are sinful. We are all sinful. I am sinful. But only by the grace of God, He's cleansed me from the unrighteousness, right, that I do for him, for, to Him through Jesus Christ. So we minimize ourselves and give glory to the Almighty God. So when you think about this, as you share the gospel, remember, this is not just the pastor's job. This is all of our job, right? Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, right? You need to go, right? We need to evangelize. We need to teach. We need to baptize, to teach them to obey God's word. That's all of us, right, as Christians, as believers. So let's look over here. They brought it back to God the Father, Right? They said, why are you doing these things? We're also men, the same nature as you preaching the gospel to you, turning from these useless things to a living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them. So let's take a closer look in the study of God. Okay? So first of all, we have to understand that God exists before ta- time began. God is pre-existing. See, all people know everywhere, as it's recorded in Romans, that everyone has a deep sense of God, that God exists, inner sense that God exists, that his creatures, and that he is the creator. But Paul says to the Gentiles, the non-believers, they knew God, but did not know him as God or give thanks to him. He says that wicked unbelievers have exchanged the truth about God to a lie. Romans chapter 1, verse 25, implying that they actively or willfully reject some truth about God's existence and character that they know. Paul says that what can be known about God is plain to them and added that this because God has shown it to them. So in other words, he's saying we all, whether you're born in Africa, in Asia, in different parts of the world, whether you grew up in a Christian home or know of God, Everyone is aware that there is a God that exists. But the question is, what do we do with that? Do we deny His nature? Do we deny Him and His majesty that that He so declares for us? There's no other text that explains this much more than Genesis chapter 1. So if you want to turn to Genesis, the first book of the Bible, 
First page, right? Genesis chapter 1. This is so key, and I'm going to explain why. It says here in verse 1 to 2 of Genesis chapter 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and desolate and emptiness. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. So in the beginning, God created creation, right? He created. He was the cause of this. And the first day, he created light. And I'm summarizing here. The second day, the skies were created. The third day, the dry lands, the seas, the plants were created. The fourth day, the sun, the moon, and the stars were created. The fifth day, creatures that live in the sea and creatures that fly were created. And on the sixth day, he made his special creation. Not just animals, but humans. He made them in his image. And the seventh day, he rested. The Sabbath day. See, the key is, if God can create all this, and I, I'm a literalist in the Bible, if it says that, I believe it was one day. If he, create, he, he can create anything at all, just in the blink of an eye, right? I am a belief, firm believer, and I know there's many uh, uh, theories out there. No, it's really one day, is really a thousand years, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, we can kind of talk about that. But I really believe if God is so superior that he created, he doesn't need time to build something. He just speaks the word and it happens all in one day, right? All in one day. So if God can create this, who can he be compared to? What other gods can you compare? So it goes down to Genesis chapter 1, the very beginning of it all. See, for the atheists, they attempt to discredit this very occurrence, because they, if they are successful in doing so, then all of the Bible is just folklore. It's, er it's an error. It's just another book. And it all starts in Genesis. So we have to, if we believe in the superiority and the majesty and the power and the glory of God, he can do all those things in a blink of an eye. And that's where we have to start. Because in many, many gods, they don't believe that, Right? God is the creator of all things. Yes, even the skies, the moons, the mountains, the people. Right? He outdoes Zeus and Hermes. You see, Hermes was a messenger between other gods. He doesn't need messengers. See, Zeus was the, 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 the god of, of, of thunder. Well, guess what? God created that. <laughs> and everything else, all the atmospheric matter that goes with it. There's not even a comparison. So perhaps when we share the gospel, yes, we have to expect the unexpected, but it's rooted down on who your view is and your interpretation of God's words. See, the problem is that the people, that the people of Lystra didn't believe in a God, small g, but that they believed in many gods, right? And this is called polytheism. So we believe in monotheism. Mono is, means one, and poly means many, right? In other words, you just can't, you just may not be able to use the existence of God to a polytheist. So let me just share with you. I have a little illustration uh, in the picture over here that uh, Miss uh, April is going to put out. We have it. Number one, the temple. All right. So you see that. So this is a temple that I actually had visited many times as a young lad, okay? It's a funny story about this. I told my wife and I think Riley about this story. I'm kind of embarrassed. But anyways, so this was a temple, a Buddhist temple, because remember, I grew up in a Buddhist household where there are many gods, polytheism, right? So this was, you go into this temple and there's a little entrance, right? And then you go in and you walk up these steps and there's just, it's huge and massive, Right? And you walk up to these steps, and you go there, and then as you enter, go ahead, second picture, you have this shrine of gods, okay? That's just one of them. And there's, you see this little kind of uh, little hub there? Well, there's many of these hubs throughout that temple. So there's a god for this, there's a god for that, there's a god for this, there's a god for that. Go back to slide number one. Right? The first one. A funny story about this. I, I, I was contemplating and sharing this. So I was a very rebellious teenager, believe it or not. 
Um, no, right? It's, it's hard to believe. So, so when I was about 17 years old, driving to this temple, you know, I, I had an argument with my mom and dad. I was driving. I nearly crashed the car into the temple, okay? This, te- this, this very temple, not like the front gate of the temple. That's how rebellious I was. I think we fought over, I don't know, like going out or something like that or dating or something. I don't even remember what it is. But nonetheless, this is my upbringing. But I realized that there was one superior God, one God. But I didn't know him. I said, okay, God, I know you exist. I know you exist, but how do I get to you, right? If you notice on the second picture, go back to the second picture, there are these, uh, you see the, see the little fruits and stuff, right? So those were, I mean, this is, this is actively happening today in many parts of the world, okay? Whether it's Buddhism and Hinduism and other different gods, you actually offer food to your god. I'm thinking, something's wrong with that. Why do I have to offer food to God, right? If God created everything, does he need food to sustain, you know, the, is he on a diet or something? What is it, right? That's just so, I started thinking about these things. If, if truly that was God, I'm like, there's some serious flaws here. So you go back, and I go back, and I'm thinking, man, how do I get to God? And that's kind of my second point. My second point is, is that we have to bring it down to Jesus Christ, the God-man. And we're going to spend some time in this today. And some of this may be review for you. Some of it may be new material. Maybe you know about it, but just haven't really studied up, and, uh, up on it. So we're going to have lots of verses. You're going to have to do your best to jot things down a little bit. Uh, What's great about it is that you can uh, review the same uh, message on our YouTube, right? Um, But I just want to share and give you tools to be able to think through that you have to bring it down to God. That's, That's what the amazing thing is, is that God sent his only son, God in flesh, the God man, to come to earth to rescue you and me. But how did you get there? It's through Jesus. John 14, 6, my life verse. This is how it started turning in my life at the age of 16. It says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, Jesus Christ. He's the God man. So perhaps in your evangelistic efforts in sharing Christ, it's not about you and what God has done about you. It's about him. Yes, you can share your story of what of God's patience in your life, but you are a new creation. The old thing is gone. The new has come. You no longer live for you. You live, you don't live for your flesh. You live for the Spirit of God. And that's what we're going to talk about today, mainly in point number two, bringing it down to Jesus Christ, the God-man. Because in other religions, there is no God-man there. It's just God with the little Gs, right? God's plural. So let's go and read through this. It's very exhaustive, but I pray, I pray that you will gain much more tools as you connect the dots and more equipped in sharing the gospel to your neighbors and your friends or whoever else it is in your life. So the emphasis, we will emphasize on the following. There are are 10 sections of this, okay? I'm going to try to go through it real quick, and I'll try to do it in a narrative form not like a lecture or anything like that. And it starts with this. Remember, it takes time, patience, prayer, intentionality, and love. And love as you share the gospel. You got to remember these things. You can't just go out and just share God, God's word. Sometimes, yes, but if you are prayerfully, if you care for your neighbor, If you're patient, if you're listening, remember God gave us two ears, one mouth, not the other way around. If your heart's intention is right in sharing the gospel, if you take time, if you're patient about it and allow the Lord to work in you, oh, wow, God is going to do amazing things, not because of you, it's because of him. So we're going to go through these 10 emphasis of bringing it down to Jesus Christ. Number one, the preexistence of Christ. 
We talked about that with God already, right? God the Father, but also Christ. Christ just didn't come up, right? He just wasn't born. He had, be, he had been pre-existing since the time has began. And it says this in John chapter 1, which says the Word became flesh, which implies that He existed previously into His incarnation. Does that make sense? Before 2,000 years ago, He just didn't exist. He had existed before then. And it says this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. It says here, Then God said, Let us, plural, make mankind into our own image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea the birds of the sky uh, and the livestock and all over the earth and everything every crawling thing that crawls on the earth you see the word us is a plural form it indicates the trinity it didn't use the word trinity but it implies it that the father the son and the holy spirit has already existed before creation That's the amazing thing. Number two, the emphasis of bringing it down to Jesus, the God-man. We have to emphasize that the prophecies about Christ, the prophecies about Christ. First, in his birth, Genesis chapter 5, Galatians chapter 4, but when the appropriate time had come, God sent out his son, born of a woman, born under the law, and we see his pro- uh, this prophecy in Genesis 49, his lineage, his birthplace, Bethlehem. Compassion and judgment, as it indicates in Isaiah chapter 9. Prophets to come, Deuteronomy uh, 18. He functions as a priest. His betrayal in Psalms 41 verse 9. Being sold for 30 pieces of silver in Zechariah chapter 11. His violent death, Zechariah chapter 12. His resurrection, Psalm 16. His exaltation to God's right hand, Psalms 110. His eternal reign in fulfillment of the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and Isaiah 55. See, these very prophecies of Jesus, it just, it, it's very prophetic. It's going to come. And what? guess what? There are many more prophecies that are to come to come that's not fulfilled yet and it's going to come in the end times of the book of revelations and we're going to read that hopefully at some point we'll do a study series on revelation so again we bring it down to god so now you have you can defend god you can share jesus christ by telling people that he had pre-existed even before time began and number two he had the prophecies that supported him being born right about him being the Christ. And number three, the humanity of Christ. And now we're going to kick it into like a uh, second gear a little bit, okay? I don't know if you guys know manual transmissions and stuff like that. Now I think we press buttons or move dials or something right now. So we're going to kick it into second gear, the humanity of Christ. This is so significant. See, he had hu- a human name, Jesus. Right? That was very common. There are many Jesus recorded in the New Testament. Bar Jesus to be one of them. It was a very common name. He was experienced by others as a human being in John chapter 9. He had a body. 1 John chapter uh, 1. He spoke normal human languages. He spoke Hebrew and Aramaic. He referred himself as a man. Others referenced him as a man. He experienced life as a human being. Yes. He had a trade. He was a Jewish carpenter's son. He, he loved Home Depot. I mean, ter- seriously, right? He was a man. He experienced life as a human being. He had limitations. He was hungry, right? He loved fish, seafood. And this is to validate that he was truly a man. He loved taking a nap. I mean, who loves not taking that? I, I love taking a nap. Right? That tells you he was fully human. He was thirsty, John chapter 19. He was tired, John chapter 9. I'm sorry, John chapter 4. He had intense sorrow and distress, John chapter 11 and Luke chapter 13. He was ignorant. We're thinking, okay, wait, ignorant? Really? Well, it says in the context of him not knowing the hour and the day when when God was going to come back. He didn't know it in his humanity, right? He had a human soul, and he died, 
wow, th- these are things that, that, the, that we should know about as we share God's words to, to, to those people that God has brought before us. But what's happening in our culture, we have to understand, is that they understand that Jesus existed, and he was a man, but he's not fully God, is what they're, that the issue is. And which is what we're going to be talking about in the emphasis of number four. The deity of Christ, also known as the divinity of Christ. See, John says he was divine. He was a divine God. Paul says he was the very form of God in Philippians chapter 2, we're gonna, which we're going to read later on, as well as our great God and Savior in Titus chapter 2. He was referred to as the Lord, Yahweh, Romans chapter 10, Joel chapter 2, as well as the King of Kings, a designation of Jews such as John would only give God himself, Revelation chapter 19. He does the work of God, including creating, sustaining, saving, raising the dead, judging, sending the spirits, right? And building his church. He accepts as God himself does worship from all men. Matthew chapter 14. And angels are going to come and bow before him. And someday all men will bow to him, something only God accepts. So you see, you have this word play here. You, God, Jesus, is 100% God and 100%. That is the, that's the key. That's the key play over here. That's amazing. You see, there are many gods there, small g, that says, that claim they're God, but they're not, they're, they're not divine and 100% human. So, number five, the emphasis of why we bring it down to Jesus Christ Number five, the incarnation of Christ. The incarnation of Christ. See, Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, Matthew chapter 1, Galatians chapter 4, in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. See, John says that the eternal and divine word became flesh. That's amazing. I love that word, that Jesus dwelt among us, also known as he tabernacled with us. Does that make sense? This holy God who lives in the heavens, right, came down, and it's as if the whole tabernacle is within us, that lives in us, that lives with us as believers. Amazing. John chapter 1, verse 1 and 14, and Exodus chapter 40. See, the doctrine, the study of in the incarnation means that the second person of the Trinity, not that he's less than, took on human flesh. Jesus Christ in both undiminished deity, united with perfect humanity forever without confusion of his attributes. In other words, one person, two natures, divine, 100% God, 100% man, right? You're probably thinking, well, that doesn't work out in our common day math. Well, there's a lot of common day math that I don't understand anyways. But anyhow, but he's 100% of both man and God. That's the key. See, God became a man in order to redeem his creation and rule over it. Thus, he came to fulfill another Davidic covenant as the promised king. Because of this, his role as a lord and king, he reveals God to men. He saves sinners. He destroys the works of the devil. He judges men and brings all creation back in submission to God for him. Two things you have to understand. He's pre-existed, right? He's pre-existed. He has a humanity, right? He has a deity. He has uh, been prophesied. And now we jump into this word, impeccability. What? This is like the pecking order? No, it's not like a pecking order. The impeccability of God. Meaning, was Jesus Christ able to not sin or not able to sin? That makes sense. Jesus was tempted, yes, yet he did not sin. See, that's when humanity and divinity comes into play. The bottom line is that Jesus was both man and, and God, suffered temptation vic, uh, and suffered it victoriously, and yet we can therefore draw near to him to help us in time of our weakness. 
See, we can come to a, a, a colleague, a friend, whenever we're struggling into temptation, right? Because the chances are they've been there or they felt it, right? Or they experience it or they know someone that experienced it. But when we come to the Lord who mastered it, mastered the temptation, is very, very different. So we come to him as our father because he understands. Not only did he understand, he rules over it. He won that war. Huh. Think about that. Therefore, draw near to, 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 uh, he draw near to help us in time of our weaknesses. His temptation has given us confidence in his sympathetic heart beyond that we cannot much, uh, do much at all. We can say that no man has ever understood strength, the viciousness and deceit of temptation better than him that this precisely because he had never gave in. He is without sin. The impeccability of Jesus Christ. He's 100% God, 100% man. He was tempted, yet he did not sin. Wow, what brings, what confidence do we have in that? Wow, amazing. The next emphasis, the death of Christ. The death of Christ. All four Gospels record the death of Christ under Pontius Pilate, which is interpreted in advance by Christ Jesus himself as the death for forgiveness of sins and the establishment of the new covenant and the defeat of Satan. See, again, the divinity and humanity comes in because if he was just fully human and not God, he's just like some other dude that died. But because he's God, he's resurrected. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. But he suffered through it as God and man at the same time. Wow. Next, the emphasis of bringing it down to Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Christ. This is the very power of it all. Oh. All four Gospels record the empty tomb, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. As it says in Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, to another Mary, to Cephas, right, to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and to James, to, to, to the ten disciples, to Thomas, the other, ten, the other disciples, and the seven disciples of the Sea of Tiberias, and more than 500 people, and lastly to the eleven as he ascends to heaven. And finally to Paul. He appeared to the disciples over the course of about 40 days in Acts chapter 1, as we read a few weeks back. Wow. So not only did he was born as a prophetic king and Lord to redeem us, God is with us. He suffered. He died. And he was resurrected. Wow. What God is resurrected? What other gods do you know is resur resurrected? The gods that I knew growing up, they're dead. I mean, I have to give them food. I mean, seriously, right? And, and, and growing up uh, in, in, the, in the Buddhist tradition, we have, uh, there's this money, like fake paper money, that my parents would buy. And what we would do is we would have this little canister over here, and we would burn the money so the, the god can have the money. I, I don't understand, right? Like, to me, in my head, I'm like, okay, first of all, Something if it's your money, if it's like real money, but it's like monopoly money that you're burning so that the heavens would have money? Really? That just doesn't make sense, right? So I, I started thinking about this. You could tell how rebellious I was, right, as, as a young teen. I mean, I almost crashed a car in the temple. Seriously. Okay. So the ascension of Christ, the ascension of Christ. We're almost done. The ascension of Christ. In Luke chapter 24 and Acts, 11, uh, Acts chapter 1, Luke records for us the historical fact and nature of Jesus' ascension. The language seems to imply that Jesus ascended bodily to some places in the space of time of con continuum. But we are unable to see or know where. Theologically, however, Luke has made it very clear as to what the ascension means. It's not just Jesus going somewhere. Indeed, his ascension led to his exaltation to the throne and the right rule over creation. So he mastered it to nations over creation, over nations and the church. He has exalted to the right hand of God a place of power and authority. Wow. So he didn't just raise just to say, see ya. 
right? He was raised because that's where he belongs, in the heavens, and he seats at the right hand of the Father. He has complete command and charge over everything, everything, even your phone not working. He has every aspect, even your water pipes breaking, everything, even your, 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 your whatever, right, in life, your health, your well-being. He has complete mastery over those things. This COVID thing is nothing for him. I mean, it's like, seriously? <coughs> I mean, seriously? Really? Last but not least, the return of Christ. The return of Christ. The return of the King. The Bible predicts, right? Prophesied that someday Jesus Christ will return, and He will. And if you don't believe that, just look at what happened these past few, few years. Seriously, I'm thinking, okay, uh, I think God is uh, telling us something here, right? We need to get our hearts right. Jesus will return, and suddenly, in, a, in bodily, with great glory, for all to see, Matthew 24, Revela Revelation uh, 19. At that time, he will judge Satan and his angels and the living and the dead and will establish his kingdom in its fullest sense. Wow. That's something to look forward to, guys. If you forget that, if you don't have that in your imagery, wow. If you're suffering now, man, just wait. It's just a little bit, okay? It's poquito. Poquito suffering. But at the end, oh, man, you're going to spend eternity with the Lord. Man, you can have all those tacos. Now I'm just playing, right? You can have ah, endless glory with the Father. You'll understand everything will make sense. So here's my closing for you today. We're going to read uh, Philippians chapter 2. So turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. Okay? New Testament. If you want to be effective in your witness... You must read this as it summarizes what we've just discussed. It's all summarized in here in Philippians chapter 2 and starts at verse 1. But when we read it, and we are going to read this 18 verses, read it in the context of evangelism, okay? Read it in the context of what God, what we just read, all right? In the context of evangelism. I'll start right here. Verse 1. Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in Spirit, intent on one purpose. <laughs> we need to be intent in sharing the gospel. Instead of fighting, oh, this kind of music I want to play, or this kind of music, or, oh, this building is this, whatever. You know, fighting over churches have split literally because of the carpet of the floor, because of the piano organ. Oh, we're going to have contemporary music or traditional music. I mean, people fight over those little things. Really? But here it says we need to be united instead of shooting each other. We need to be united in sharing the gospel. That's the whole purpose. That's the goal. Mission critical. And it says here, verse 3, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but humility consider one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. In other words, don't care for people in that if they don't know Christ, they will, know, they will not know peace. If you don't care for them, as you share the gospel, if you don't truly care for them, I encourage you, don't share the gospel if you don't care for them. Because they will read you. They'll know, is this guy doing this just because his pastor says this? Or does he really care about me? And, and non-believers are really good at that. I was one of those people. Perhaps you were too. You've got to truly care about that person you're sharing the gospel with. Now, in verse uh, 5, we enter into what we just talked about. It's a summary. 
the humanity, the divinity, the impeccability, Jesus' death and his re- resurrection and his ascension all summarize here. You see, the leading God, leading people to the Lord, you have to understand these very basic principles. You have to understand the whole narrative of God's love for us. Verse 5 says this, Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself. See, this is the, the very humanity. He emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on the cross. For this reason God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, and those who are in heaven, those are on the earth and under the earth, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Wow. All summarized right there. (laughs) I could have just read that for you to save you time. But I felt that we needed to kind of break it up a little bit to understand that this is not just some, some person writing this. This is God's words. And he's giving us the tools. He's giving us the resources. And that goes to Jesus Christ. Verse 12. So then, this is the application. This, this is application. What do we do with all this knowledge? Verse 12. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my, not as in my presence only, but... Now much more in my absence. Work out your salvation. You're not working for salvation. Remember, we're saved by God's grace, right? It's not our works, so lest any man shall boast. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, meaning when you read God's word, know God's working in you, and you have to exercise your belief. It talks about this in the book of James. Yes, let your works be shown, right, through faith. It is God who is at work in you both to desire to work with, your, with His good pleasure. Do all things without complaining or argument. Ah, oh, i got to go to my mission trip again. Well, i got to go to church. Oh, man, I, it's just so comfortable just watching church from home, right? What's the big deal? Well, you're missing out on the fellowship. You're missing out on the the fellowship of praying together, seeing each other's faces. What joy God brings without complaining or arguments, right? So that you will prove yourself to be blameless and innocent. Children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. What's interesting about this word blameless, and I shared this with the youth, blameless means innocent, right? Same word that he's using interchangeably. There's to be no hint of sin in your life. I'm like, well, kind of falls short of that, but that's God's grace, right? He gives it to you. But you need to strive to live holy for him in every aspect of your life. From what you see, from what you think, from what you watch, Whatever your hands hold, wherever your feet go, it needs to be holy living for Him. Because again, this is the application. The world looks at you more than anything else. If you're saying you're a Christian, but if you're coming to work late or can't complete a project or is calling in sick all the time or can't, is making an excuse, what good of a witness are you? As Christians, we need to be the best of all the things. Whether you're mopping the floor whether you're a, cash, uh, a cashier, whether you're counting accounts, whether you're in healthcare, whether you're in oil and gas, you need to be the very best. You need to be the nominated employee of the month and of the year. You see, that is the greatest testimony that we have. You can have your Bibles, but if you can't even come to work on time, can't even converse and, have, uh, and work with people that are very different from you, Right? How are you being a witness for God? Right? Some of you guys remember 
growing up, right, and you have a project, whether it's college or high school, and you're the one only, you're the only one, like, picking up the boat, right? All the weight is on you because no one else, oh, I forgot my homework. They didn't complete it. And it's up to you. That's what God is saying. It's up to you. You have to carry the weight as leaders and as followers for Christ. Be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach. This is a very interesting word. This above reproach is actually listed for pastors. You need to be above reproach. As deacons, you need to be above reproach. But it says here, Everyone has to be above reproach for Christ. It's not just for the office. In the midst of the crooked, this crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights of the world. You have to be a light. How could you be a light at home? If you don't even go to church and engage in Bible study. If you say you're a Christian and say that, oh yeah, I have my time with God alone. I do not know a Christian that grows exponentially having Bible study by themselves at home without fellowshipping, without engaging in Bible study. If you believe that, that is a lie from hell. You need to come to church. You need to be engaged in Scripture and Bible study. I desire for you, and you know what? If you're in leadership here, I encourage you. If you're doing those things but can't do the very basic, you don't need to be in leadership, to be honest with you. You do not need to be in leadership. Holding firmly the word of life so that the day of Christ I can take pride because I did not run nor toil in vain. I'm sorry, run in vain nor labor in vain. But even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifices and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you. We need to have joy. He knew that his time was coming. Paul's time was coming. But his joy is not about his, him saving his life. It's about sharing and doing the works, that, the, the purpose that he has uh, from, from God. God has a very purpose for you. It's not just collecting your paycheck. It's not just waiting for retirement. It's not just getting through school so that you can go to college or do something like that. No, it's not just that. Those are very important things. But the most important, what are you doing for the gospel? And that's what Paul is saying. My joy is when you guys, when the churches I planted through God, right, through the Holy Spirit has helped me, the joy is that you're following in obedience through God's words. So I know today's heavy. It's very heavy. I warned you. I'm not going to te- teach and preach something that makes you tickle and tickle your ears to make you feel good. I want you to feel good. But I want you more to be obedient for the Lord. And sharing the gospel. And what great time to share the gospel than now. And if you can't share the gospel, something is up here. You're, you're, we're, we're thinking we're in two different realms. That's the whole point of us coming together as brothers so we can encourage one another. That is my prayer for you. Be joyful. Be joyful in your pursuit. Our labor and our strive for the gospel is not to be so, of, so much of a burden. We need to be joyful of coming to see faces, to shake hands, to talk and discuss, to be prayer in prayer and to fellowship. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you. Thank you, Father, for the word of God that is living and sharper than a two-edged sword who cuts through marrow, cuts through our inner hearts. As I'm preaching to my church, it cuts through me and my heart. Am I being faithful with what you've given to me? Am I sharing the good news? The best vaccine ever that can save souls, not just to save them from this this pandemic, but to save souls for eternity. Lord, help us to reflect of your goodness, God. Forgive us of areas we failed or we did not have the courage to share the gospel. Or we're so inundated in ourselves that we're so thinking about ourselves that we failed the very basic requirements that you have for us as growing mature believers for you. Lord, forgive us for making excuses. Lord, I desire for our church to do more than what they've called themselves 
what they feel about themselves. Man, you could reach, we could reach this community, this county, and beyond more than we can ever imagine. Lord, I pray that we would rest in you, Jesus. You gave us the tools. Help us to apply. Help us to have faith and not fear for you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is, a, this is your time to respond as a church. Again, today was very heavy. But I pray that it would be a reminder for us all. For me, as I prepared this. Wow, God is good. Now that we have the tools, you need to respond. Is it somebody that you're praying for in particular? This is your time. This is open. Joy will be here. I will be here. We'll have our mass on. <laughs> we want to pray for you. Perhaps it's something that's holding you back. I don't know what it is. You need to come and pray. We want to pray with you and want to give it to the hands and feet of Jesus. Perhaps you haven't fully trusted the Lord. Maybe you've been playing church for a long time. This is your time to make that known, to tell people to give your life to the Lord. Perhaps you're from a different fellowship and you want to join our fellowship or interested in our church. We'd love to talk to you. I'd love to share with you what I know, that God is faithful here. So you come. This is your time to respond.
All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I pray that you were blessed. I know it's a lot of material. Read it. This is your tools for you to be equipped in sharing the gospel as you enter, as you enter into the field of ministry. Again, it's not just my job. It's everyone's job, right? It's everyone's job to make kingdom impact for him. That's why we exist as a church. Real quick, uh, a reminder, next week, actually, Joy and my family, we are going to be out of town. We're going to have a guest speaker, great man of God uh, that I'm getting to know a little bit more. Um, uh, Marcus Barton, which is Mr. Wendell's uh, son, will be preaching for us at church next week. Be praying about that. He's a great guy, man man of God. He's going to be going through Acts. We're going to continue in Acts chapter 14, and he's going to close us out for that. But anyways, let me pray for us as we uh, uh, just ascending uh, of the Holy Spirit as we enter into his kingdom. Father, we come before you. Lord, thank you so much. You are so good, Lord. You are so good. And I pray that you would remind us of your goodness each and every day. We work out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing the grace that you've given us, that we could share that same word to others so that they could not come to know you. And Lord, as we're growing as, as, as believers and followers of you, help us to engage, help us to yearn, help us in our prayer life, help us in our devotional life. Help us in our involvement in our church, the Bible studies that are here, the men, the women, and the the youth and the children to be engaged, to learn more about you, Lord, so that we can be encouraged to share the gospel that is life-changing. Bless us all here. Bless those that are home. Lord, bring them back when it's appropriate to come to our fold again, to be able to join us so we can see each other and worship together and praise and encourage one another in our pursuit of holiness, Father, for you. Bless us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, the blood.